In negotiations that went down last weekend at the COP27 meeting in Egypt, countries reached a historic decision to establish and operationalize a loss and damage fund, particularly for nations most vulnerable to the climate crisis. Kome Ajegbo, Vice President Investment Africa Finance Corporation, AFC, joins me to discuss how this decision impacts Africa and the implications for Africa's energy transition. It's good to have you here, Kome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, well, we, this whole thing has been historic because Africa has been at the brunt of climate change. We've been suffering. Possibly we emit less carbon than other developed countries. Well, what are the, uh, the COP finally reached a loss and damage deal. This is good news. However, what is the real cost for the countries uh, that emit more carbon? So I think this is a fantastic question. And I actually would like to break it down into two pieces. So first, what is the actual deal? that was reached, and then we can get to what is the real cost, right, for countries that are emitting more. So when we take a step back, even though it was announced that a deal was reached, when we dig into it, this, the metrics, the fundamentals are actually yet to be agreed. So we know a transition committee needs to be set up. The nominations are yet to happen. Um, the committee will be set up by December of this year. Secondly, their first meeting is not until March next year. And then they have a whole year, i.e. up until COP28 next year, to actually present a proposal to the UNFCC to actually you know, vote, discuss, and actually agree on. So when we talk about a loss and damage deal being reached, the substance and the form is still yet to be dis determined. But I think what we can say in summary is a lot of the rich countries, as The Economist put it, have finally sort of decided to acknowledge that they probably do need to compensate the less emitting countries. Now, when we talk about what is the real cost, because the fundamentals of the deal are actually yet to be set up, we don't know how much is going to be contributed. We don't know the funding instruments. We don't know who's going to be eligible. We don't know how much commitments are going to go in there. But in order to understand or determine what the cost should be, I think it's important to understand what is the cost of loss and damage? So if we start first thinking about the NDCs and the commitments African countries have made, it's estimated that we need to invest $300 billion on an annual basis up until the year 2030. However, to date, only about 30 billion has been invested. So there's already a significant gap in terms of the commitment for climate financing, mitigation, and adaptation. And then when you bring it home and think about the context in Nigeria and the floods that we've been having, the World Bank Group estimated that about $17 billion was lost due to loss and damage from floods in the year 2012 alone. That's in 2012. And we all experience and appreciate the impact of the floods this year. So I think if we, if we take a step back, right, yes, the deal has been reached in principle. The substance and the form is yet to be determined. When we talk about what is the real cost for countries emitting more carbon, we don't know what it is yet, but we do have an indicator of what it should be. Mm. This is quite interesting to know and uh, quite vague at the moment. We would like more clarity on that. Uh, you mentioned that uh, $300 billion is needed uh, annually by tw to be reached by 2030. And then we, right now, we're currently at $30 billion, And Nigeria is already, like, from the flooding, we've lost about $17 billion. Uh, so how do you think we can bridge this gap, this funding gap that we have, especially for Africa that is trying to transit, you know, to cleaner energy, cleaner fuels, how do you think we can, you know, mitigate, Africa can mitigate this, and what are the financial implications since we already lost so much? So there's a lot in there to unpack. I think if we first start with the financial implications of the loss and damage deal, unfortunately, like I just mentioned, the substance and form is still yet to be determined, so we don't really know the implications for Africa. Not yet. We know the cost of loss and damage, but we don't know if this new mechanism is actually going to you know, be a drop in the bucket or be a substantive opportunity to really transform things. Then when we talk about, you know, financing for mitigation and climate change and adaptation. So many people have very possibly forgotten that just a little over 10 years ago, the Green Climate Fund was set up and it was set up specifically just like the loss and damage uh, deal was, was created. It was set up specifically to provide financing to mitigate against climate change, but not just to mitigate, also for adaptation. Its priority was on Africa, on least developed countries, and SIDS. 
$10 billion was committed. Over $11 billion has been actually committed by the Green Climate Fund to date. So over the $10 billion commitment that they have. They're currently in a replenish, replenishment cycle trying to access more funding, but we need to take advantage of the opportunities that are being presented to us. We need to ensure that the seat we have at the table is substantive, it is pragmatic, and it's providing expedient solutions to the continent. There's a lot of institutions that are currently unable to access this funding, and we need to find a way to ensure that we can do that. The Africa Finance Corporation, the organization within which I work, is one of the first institutions, African institutions, that was accredited by the Green Climate Fund. We are able to access this financing and create our own innovative financing solutions. We're also working on the ICRF, which is focused on climate resilience and adaptation. So like we are doing, many other institutions need to start to think about innovative financing solutions to mitigate and adapt climate change. And finally, you know, when we talk about imminent energy transition, it, it really pains me to hear people talk about the energy transition on the continent. You know, when you're talking about transition, it means you have something and you're moving from one form of energy to another. We're talking about a constant where more than 50% of the people do not have access to power. So what exactly are we transitioning for, from or to, right? I think we need to change the narrative and be a little bit more focused on ensuring that we are getting sustainable access to power. Sustainable access means base load. It doesn't just mean renewables or wind or solar. We need to utilize the abundant resources on the continent to ensure we are able to successfully develop and facilitate and, 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 uh, and catalyze economic development on the continent. Um, so that's, that's sort of, in, in summary, I would say the seat at the table we have, you know, is substantive and we really need to be a driving force for pragmatic change. Thanks so much, Komi Ajegbo. We do hope that these, uh, uh, what you've mentioned, or uh, what you've mentioned, will shape conversations for future, especially for COP28 that's coming up next year. Future conversations on climate change will be shaped by these uh, factors that you've mentioned. And uh, we do hope African governments key into this and other institutions key into this to be able to, you know, you know, pave the way for a, a greener, greener Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Komi Ajegbo, for coming on the program. Thank you.